Now on WCNC Charlotte, a Verify special answering questions from you, the viewers at home. Today, we're looking at a social media claim saying if you weigh over 200 pounds, you need a different size needle when it comes to getting vaccines. And with the 2023 election over, all eyes are on 2024. But if someone decides not to run again, what happens to all the cash they've raised? And if you're getting a gift card this holiday season, you may want to spend it before it expires. We're verifying the rules on just how long they're good for. Thank you for joining us here on WCNC Charlotte. I'm Colin Mayfield. And I'm Vanessa Rufus. For the next 30 minutes, we are taking a look at some of our verify stories from the past year, helping you determine fact from fiction. And these questions came from you, the viewers at home. First today, several social media posts claim if you're over a certain weight and you're getting a vaccine like the COVID shot, you actually need a bigger needle for the vaccine to be effective. WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg verifies. These TikTok videos and social media posts claim if you are over a certain weight, you need a one and a half inch needle and not a standard one inch needle for some vaccines. Is that true? Let's verify. Our sources, family physician, Dr. Carla Robinson, the CDC and CVS. The CDC has a list of recommendations for how long the needle should be for administering a vaccine, depending on your age and weight. For women who weigh more than 200 pounds or men who weigh more than 260, 60 pounds, a one and a half inch needle is recommended. So for people who are of a heavier body weight, it's necessary to sometimes have a longer needle in order to reach the muscle for vaccines that are delivered within the muscle. Dr. Robinson says most adult vaccines are administered in the muscle. Those include the flu shot, COVID-19 shot and tetanus shot, just to name a few. But will the vaccine be more inefficient if it's a shorter needle? It may not be as effective as it would normally be because there are certain enzymes um, that are needed in order to activate um, that is found within the muscle. Dr. Robinson says that doesn't mean you need to get another shot if a one inch needle was used, but she says it's always a good idea to advocate for yourself and ask what needle size your doctor or pharmacy is using. CVS told us they follow CDC guidance when selecting which needle length to use for each patient. So we can verify that yes, if you are over a certain weight, you need a one and a half inch needle and not a standard one inch needle for some vaccines. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. Well, the 2023 election's over. All eyes are on the 2024 election, and federal politicians often have millions of dollars in their campaign war chests. But what happens to that money if they decide not to campaign any longer? Casey Decker looked into it. It seems like members of Congress are constantly fundraising, filling their campaign war chests for the next election. But what happens to that money if they decide not to run again? Verify viewer Karen wanted to know, can politicians do whatever they want with leftover campaign funds? So Karen, let's verify. Our sources are the Federal Election Commission and the Code of Federal Regulations. When they decide to leave office, federal politicians have a lot of flexibility when it comes to their war chests. First, they're allowed to spend the money on winding down expenses, basically paying bills and whatever else is required to close up their offices. Some choose to issue refunds to individual donors. Some choose to do nothing with the money in case they decide to run again later. Politicians are also allowed to donate the money to charity, or they can donate it to other politicians, though the amount they can donate is capped at a few thousand dollars per candidate. They can donate unlimited money to their party through their state, local, or national committees or they can essentially convert their war chest into a political action committee, which allows them to spend the money more freely later on. But they are not allowed to spend campaign dollars for personal use. The money can't just be deposited in their bank accounts or used to pay their mortgages. So we can verify, no, politicians cannot do whatever they want with leftover campaign funds. That doesn't mean they don't try though. A 2018 investigation by our sister station, WTSP and the Tampa Bay Times found numerous instances in which campaign money was spent on sports tickets, expensive meals, liquor, or doling out checks to friends and family. Following the report, some of these campaigns were investigated by the FEC. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. A report from the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission showed from 2021 to 2022, there was a 22% increase in injuries from e-scooters. That led one viewer to ask if an accident happens while riding one of these scooters, who's at fault for the hospital bills? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg looked into it. 
Look around Uptown and South End and you'll see e-scooters sprawled on the sidewalks. But who's responsible if you're injured on one of them? Let's get the facts. Our sources are attorney Gary Monty, attorney Jeremy Maddox, and Lime Scooters. Before you hop on one of these, you need to put your credit card information in and agree to the terms and conditions to take a ride. Looking at Lime, just one of the companies operating here in Charlotte, their user agreement outlines their waiver and release claims stating you agree to assume all risks and accept all responsibility for any accident, injury, property damage, death, or disability you may suffer on one of their scooters. In all likelihood, is going to have to pay their own hospital bills. Monty says in court, it's hard to go against a waiver you sign. And the arbitration agreements are frequently upheld by North Carolina courts and, in fact, courts around the country. Lime's user agreement also has a provision saying you need to try to settle the dispute first. The place that you have to go for arbitration is called AAA. It's the name of an arbitration company. And that means you don't get a jury trial. However, Monty does say there are some exceptions. If you're a minor and you're signing this contract and, and somehow you've managed to use a scooter, even if you're underage, let's say, you can make an argument that you were not old enough to consent to the contract, that kind of thing. Or if there was some type of a defect in the scooter itself. Maddox says people should also be aware of a law in NC called contributory negligence. You know, basically, if you were even 1% at fault for how the incident occurred, you may get nothing. This is why Maddox says it's important to carefully follow instructions and be sure to read the fine print before hopping on. With Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. We often get questions from viewers asking if a class action settlement is real. Many times it is, but sometimes it's a scam. Brandon Lewis verifies how you can tell the difference. If you're eligible to participate in a class action settlement, you'll often get an email explaining how to claim your money. Usually, you'll have to provide some personal information, but that's also exactly what scammers want you to do, making fake settlement emails an easy way to target people. We get many viewers asking us if settlement emails they received are legit. So using these sources, we're going to show you how to spot a scam email. Here's an email we got from viewer Tara. Let's walk you through how we determine that this is a scam so you can do the same. The first red flag is the vague details about the case. The BBB says real notices contain specifics like the case number, court information, and who is eligible to take part. All of that is missing here. Second, check the sender's contact information. This email was supposedly sent by a James Nielsen from Notify, but if you search that name online, one of the first results is a scam warning. Real settlement cases have websites that come up during a search and provide an administrator's contact information so you can confirm any email you receive is real. Third, this email claims Tara is entitled to more than $80,000. This is an unusually large amount. AARP says most people get just a few dollars from a settlement, so anything higher is suspicious. Fourth, the email encourages Tara to act quickly. This is a common technique that scammers use to convince you to act urgently before you realize it's a scam. And finally, there's the link. Real notices should clearly show the website's full URL. Make sure to hover over any hyperlinks before clicking to ensure it's sending you where you want to go. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. Bank of America Stadium is seeing more and more big concerts every year. Luke Combs and Beyonce this year, just a few examples. But if you bought tickets and then sold them, you could have to pay taxes on them. WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg is breaking down why. Several big names came to Charlotte this year during their concert tours, and you might have made a pretty penny from reselling tickets. But this year, you may have to give Uncle Sam some of that money back. The question, if you sell something for more than $600 on an e-commerce site, will you get a 1099-K form? Let's verify. Our sources, Mark Stieber, Tax Information Officer for Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, the IRS, and several e-commerce sites. According to the IRS, last year a new law went into effect that now requires sales completed on e-commerce platforms to report to the IRS if they make more than $600. If it's more than $600, you're going to get a 1099-K from the platform. And not only are you going to get one, 
the IRS is going to get one. Several e-commerce sites say they will send a 1099-K form to the seller. Steber says remember that all income earned is taxable unless it's specifically under the tax code like life insurance and gifts. Under the law, person-to-person transfers are not supposed to be included, like sending your daughter gas money at college. But if you are selling stuff on eBay, you're supposed to get one of these, and you've got to account for that on your tax return. So we can verify that, yes, if you sell something for more than 600 on an e-commerce site, you will get a 1099-K form. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. Well, if you're getting a gift card this holiday season, you may want to spend it before it expires. After this break, we're verifying the rules and how long they're good for. Plus, if you have a membership to Sam's Club or Costco, you can get gas on the cheap. But does one store have better gas than the other? We got the answer. Welcome back. Chances are you have a few gift cards lying around you probably or may get some this holiday season. But did you know they start losing money after a while? Tina S from Waxaw recently reached out to say that she had an issue with a gift card after just six months and wanted to know if they can expire that soon. Mm. WCNC Charlotte's Megan Brack verifies. Tina S from Waxall wrote on Facebook about a gift card from a local store that lost its full value within six months. She says the store wouldn't let her make a purchase using the amount on the card, which was $60. But many in the comments were saying gift cards should be good for five years. So the question, are store gift cards supposed to expire only after five years? Let's verify. Our source is the Federal Trade Commission, the Credit Card Act of 2009, and Tom Bartholomew, president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau, here in Charlotte. It's easy to forget what gift cards you got for your birthday or a holiday. But if you are sitting on unused gift cards, can you still use them? It's a federal law that uh, uh, basically states that uh, gift cards and gift certificates uh, have to at last at least five years. The federal law stems from the Credit Card Act of 2009, which says a gift card cannot expire for at least five years from the date the card was purchased or the last date funds were reloaded. In order to protect consumers, uh, give them more time, there was a lot of shenanigans going on with gift cards before then. According to the Federal Trade Commission, if the expiration date listed on the card is less than five years, the value can be transferred to a replacement card at no cost. However, inactivity fees can be charged if the card hasn't been used for at least one year. There can be inactivity fees, but uh, it's got to be spelled out to the purchaser of those gift cards. So we can verify that yes, store gift cards can expire only after five years and you should be able to use them for up to one year penalty free. With your Verify, I'm Megan Bragg. Of course, all of us are always looking for a bargain, even at the pump, but you can often find one at your local Sam's Club or maybe Costco as the stores offer cheaper prices at the pump with a membership though. But is there a quality difference if you go this route? Hmm. And Allred verifies most savvy consumers know warehouse clubs like Costco and Sam's Club have cheaper fuel. But is there any difference between the two? Let's verify. Is the gas quality the same at Sam's Club and Costco? Our sources, AAA, TopTierGas.com, and the Environmental Protection Agency, which sets gasoline regulations. According to AAA, all gas starts as a base fuel. Retailers take this base fuel and add a different blend of additives. The additives clean and protect the engine of a car. In 1990, the EPA required all gas retailers to use a minimum level of additives to keep an engine clean. But in 2004, some automakers decided these additives just weren't cutting it and established a gas standard called Top Tier Gas, which requires more additives, mainly detergents. AAA put Top Tier Gas to the test using an independent lab, and the results show Top tier gas does make a difference. After about 4,000 miles, testers found that top tier gas caused 19 times fewer carbon deposits in engines. It's definitely going to be uh, better for your engine than not. Uh, that's what the research has found. And when I asked the EPA, they agreed. Spokesperson Shayla Powell told me top tier standards can provide useful benefits to consumers beyond the regulatory minimums. And that's where Sam's Club and Costco come in. Costco has top tier gas. Sam's Club does not. 
We can verify no, the gas quality is not the same at Sam's Club and Costco. Costco is a top tier gasoline retailer, meaning the fuel includes more detergents and keeps your engine cleaner over time. Well, you may have seen the viral claim that kids behave worse when their moms are around. Many moms might agree, but is it really true? Christy Diaz digs through the facts to verify. The headline is bold, claiming children behave 800% worse in the presence of their mother. It says the reason is pheromones and cites a Dr. K.P. Leibowitz from the University of Washington's psychology department. The claim has gotten intense reaction from parents. But is it true? Let's verify. Our sources are the University of Washington Psychology Department, the Wayback Machine, an Internet Archive, and Samantha Speed, a licensed professional counselor who works with children. Speed says the claim, although it sounds good, is not true. First of all, the researcher didn't exist. And second of all, the data was no, nowhere to be seen. The University of Washington confirms that. The psychology department said, we do not know the origin or author of the document. We do know there is no Dr. K.P. Leibowitz at the University of Washington in any of our current or historical databases. The satirical study has popped up in social media posts, websites, blogs, even a news site in Africa. All of them source this website, Mom News Daily. The website, based out of India, circles back to the fake study. Emails to the website creators have gone unanswered. Even though all the data is fake, Samantha says there is some truth to the claim. Children often act out or behave in certain ways like this when they're around their primary caregivers, mainly because they feel a sense of safety and security. She says it could be a dad, a grandparent, a nanny, or another caregiver. Anyone with whom the child feels safe to show their emotions. You're telling me this is really a good thing. Yes. So we can verify, no, children are not 800% worse when their moms are in the room, but they do tend to show their big feelings to the people they feel most comfortable. With your Verify, I'm Christy Diaz. Well, if you get a real Christmas tree, you probably just throw it away when you're done with it, but one article claims you should eat it. After the break, we're talking to the experts about if this is something you should really do, or maybe not. Welcome back. Have you ever heard the claim that we swallow spiders while we're sleeping? Well, lucky for us, it might not actually be true. Randall Lewis gets the facts. Does it feel like you keep finding spider webs in your home no matter how many times you clean? In a 2016 study, researchers found spiders in every home they checked. In fact, one is probably looking at you right now. Verify viewer Carrie emailed us to ask about a claim she heard that humans end up swallowing a few spiders every year while sleeping. So let's verify. Do humans regularly swallow spiders while sleeping? Our sources are the Burke Museum in Seattle, Floyd Shockley with the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and Michael Bruce, founder of thesleepdoctor.com. The idea is that if we sleep with our mouths open, then a spider might walk inside, causing us to swallow it unconsciously. As near as we can recall, it was first published in a book on insect and spider folklore back in 1954 was the first mention of it. Then it proliferated uh, over the years. Our sources say there was never any scientific evidence that this happens. Spiders are not gonna walk into basically a dark, moist cave where all that's coming out of it is carbon dioxide. That doesn't really make a lot of sense just from an etymology standpoint. Bruce says nine in 10 people sleep with their mouths closed, meaning the spiders can't get in. If you're sleeping with your mouth open, you're probably snoring and the vibration is gonna scare them away. Put simply, the Burke Museum writes, for a sleeping person to swallow even one live spider would involve so many highly unlikely circumstances that for practical purposes, we can rule out the possibility. No such case is on formal record anywhere in scientific or medical literature. So no, humans do not regularly swallow spiders while sleeping. This is an urban legend. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis.
good news there. All right, well, cilantro is one of those foods that people either love or hate. Some even claiming it tastes like soap. Adia Daytel is here to verify if your aversion to the herb really is genetic. Cilantro is one of those herbs you either love or hate. For many of those haters out there, like me, cilantro tastes like soap. Many people believe genetics play a role. Verify viewer Gene texted us to ask if there is scientific proof. So we dug into the data of three scientific studies and spoke to Dr. Joanne Cole at the University of Colorado School of Medicine to verify. The answer needs context. Studies show that genetics, exposure, and geography all contribute to different perceptions of cilantro's taste. A study published in Chemical Sciences in 2012 tested the taste and smell of cilantro in 286 sets of twins. The study found that three genetic variations impacted how people experience cilantro. Genetics company 23andMe conducted a separate study in 2012 that found a fourth genetic variation which makes it more likely that cilantro will taste bad. But experts like Dr. Cole say more studies are needed to determine how much of an impact genetics play compared to other factors, like geography and exposure to the herb. A 2012 study from the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto collected data from more than 1,000 people from various ethnocultural groups to determine the geographical component of disliking cilantro. They found that the likelihood of disliking the herb varied widely between groups. The researchers noted that people from cultures who typically use cilantro in their cuisines, like Middle Eastern, Hispanic, and South Asian groups, dislike cilantro the least. With your Verify, I'm Ariande Till. And finally today, if you got a real Christmas tree this season, what do you plan on doing with it following the holiday? Hmm. Well, one article making the rounds on social media suggests folks should eat their Christmas trees. Yeah, but should you actually do that? WCNC Charlotte's Megan Bragg verifies. So it's this article that cites food experts talking about different ways you can use your Christmas tree in your meals. So I have a fake Christmas tree and I will not be doing this. But if you have a real one, can you eat your Christmas tree? To get answers, we went to family physician Dr. Carla Robinson, Dr. Pyle Coley, and the National Christmas Tree Association. Dr. Carla Robinson tells us certain Christmas trees are actually edible. However, consuming the one in your home, probably not your best bet for a number of reasons. You just don't know in many cases where your tree came from. So you don't know if it was treated with any pesticides or any other chemicals that could potentially harm you if ingested. The article claims you can make teas or seasoning from your tree, but both doctors say steer clear unless you know for certain you have a non-poisonous pine and it hasn't been treated with chemicals. Some varieties that uh, we know are particularly harmful are uh, trees like cypress trees, cedar trees. So if those are the types of trees that you use for your home for, uh, you know, your Christmas trees, uh, you you, you don't, definitely don't want to eat those. Even if it's not poisonous, Dr. Coley tells us the needles can still be irritants in your system. Needles are very sharp. So if you think about putting something sharp inside your mouth, even swallowing it, even after you chew it in your esophagus and your stomach, you could actually cause mucus you know, damage, mucous membrane damage in your mouth. According to the Christmas Tree Association, the best way to recycle your tree, bring it to a drop off recycling center or tree recycling and mulching program, or just use your curbside recycling pickup. With your Verify Fact Check, I'm Megan Bragg. All right, so there you have it. And we do thank you so much for joining us for this Verify special. And if you ever have anything you want verified, like the stories you saw, just email us at verify at WCNC.com.